morning, everyone. My name is Ana Catalan. I work at the Early Intervention Service for Psychosis in Basurto University Hospital. And we are talking today about clinical high risk for psychosis, diagnosis, and treatment. And we will see if it is possible to prevent the transition to psychosis in psychiatry. No, yes, okay. This is the psychotic illness evolution. Here you can, you can see that we have the premorbid state with no symptoms at all. Then in some cases, not in all cases, but in some cases, the first premorbid symptoms can appear. These symptoms are quite in a specific, like anxiety or depressive symptoms. After that, psychotic symptoms can came out that is hallucinations and delusions. And this is when we uh, do the first treatment, the early intervention, the first early intervention, usually with antipsychotics and psychotherapy. After the first treatment, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately sometimes this, uh, some patients can develop chronic symptoms, as you know. So we now intervene here after the first psychotic symptoms, and we want to intervene in this premorbid symptoms state with a prevention service, and it is called PREGAP. We will talk it about, uh, about it later. This is the prevention classification. We can have the WHO classification. They define primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. We are talking about here tertiary prevention because uh, primary prevention, sorry because we are trying to, to decrease the, the onset of a psychotic disorder in this case. But uh, for me, it's more useful this another classification, the Gordon classification, because he talked about universal, selective, and indicated prevention. The indicated prevention targets high-risk people who are identified as having subtle symptoms of the disorder and biological markers indicating predisposition for a mental disorder, in this case, psychosis, but who do not meet diagnostic criteria for the disorder at that time. So we are talking here about the clinical high risk for psychosis paradigm. And it's based on the detection of outreach individuals, pronostic evaluation, and the establishment of preventive interventions. So this kind of classification for us is more useful. Obviously, we are talking about young people because we are talking about prevention. Clinical high risk for psychosis group includes these three groups of subjects. The first group is the most uh, frequent, the attenuated psychotic syndromes. Here you can see it. These subjects suffer from psychotic symptoms below the threshold for psychosis. So we can't do the diagnosis of psychosis yet. The second group is the brief limited intermittent psychotic episodes group, this one of here. These subjects suffer from psychotic symptoms, but they, uh, they are uh, severe enough to do the diagnosis for first episode psychosis, but these symptoms last less than one week. And the last group is this one from here, the genetic risk and deterioration syndrome. And in this group, we can find subjects with first degree relatives with psychotic disorder, and they have suffered in the previous year an important withdrawal of the functional uh, social functioning. So as I have said before, the most frequent group is the APS group. 85% of, of this clinical high risk for psychosis group is about APS. Then we can find the bleeps, 10% and 5% of GRD. Most of the studies talking about, are talking about diagnosis, how to do or to carry out the diagnosis of this group. We can find some studies talking about prognosis and unfortunately the less frequent studies are about intervention in this group. The attenuated psychosis syndromes was included in the DSM-5. As you know, the DSM-5 is the psychiatric classification for psychiatric mental disorders, the last version, in two sections. In the section three, this section is for disorders which need more study. So they are under study 
and it's included as well in the other specified schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders. This means that we can do this diagnosis, um, and this is useful because we can compare between the different studies. We know how to do the diagnosis of this kind of subjects, the clinical high risk for psychosis uh, subjects. And we can think if this is uh, useful, uh, this or is valid, these DSM-5 attenuated psychotic syndrome. So we performed this study a couple of years ago to see the validity of this kind of diagnosis. And we saw once again that the most frequent uh, clinical high risk for psychosis paradigm was APS. The prevalence in general population was quite low, 0.3%, and the results of psychosis was 23% after three years of follow-up. This is for uh, the transition to psychosis from this state, from clinical high risk for psychosis to psychosis disorder. DSM-5 APS criteria is associated as well with frequent depressive comorbid disorder, distress, anxiety, suicidality, and functional impairment. So they suffer from another kind of psychiatric symptoms as well. I know that it's a horrible table, but it's just to show you that we have another scale to, to do the diagnosis of uh, APS. This is the DSM-5. Dens, dens, um, but we have uh, a SIPS scale, the recent version of the SIPS scale as well, and the CAMS scale. I know this scale the most because you need to be trained to, to do the, the scale. It's quite long, about two hours and quite complete. So in this table, you can see the different um, items to do the diagnosis of clinical high risk for psychosis state. And they are similar, but not exactly the same. So depends on the scale you use, you can find some differences between these diagnoses, uh, doing more difficult the comparison between studies. This is just an example from the CARMS. It's quite long, as I have said before, so it's just two hours of assessment. So here you can say one of the symptoms, you know, shall feel content. You should score from zero, no symptoms at all, to six when the, the subject is already psychotic. Then we need to score the frequency and duration of the symptoms. If the symptoms are related to the drugs and the level of distress for the subject. And here you can find another scale quite useful for us, the SOFAR scales, to measure the social functioning of the, of the subjects. This is quite easy uh, to do from zero to 100, 10% uh, it will be no good uh, functioning and 10% uh, 100%, sorry, superior functioning in all the activities of the subjects. Once you have done the GAMS scale, you have to score here to see which group of uh, subjects you can include the, the patient, APS, BLIPS, or genetic group. They have to meet all the criteria you see here to be in one of these groups. Which is the inter-rated reliability for the SM5 APS uh, criteria? It seems it's quite good and comparable with that of other DSM-5 mental disorders. For example, you can see here schizophrenia or mild neurocognitive disorder. So it's quite good, the reliability of this diagnosis. However, the diagnostic agreement between the different scales, in this case, the SM5 and CARS, is only medium, it's not so good. These subjects suffer from a lot of comorbidity in psychiatry, almost half percent of them, 50%, 50% of them suffer from depressive symptoms. They can suffer from bipolar disorder as well, social phobia in 22% of the cases, and anxiety symptoms or anxiety disorders as well. This is an important study published in 2020 in Schizophrenia Balletin. 
to analyze the risk and protective factors for psychosis onset in the clinical high risk for psychosis state. All the factors with an O ratio below one, they are protective factors, and that factors with the O ratio above one, for example, this one, are risk factors. So almost all the psychotic symptoms, positive, negative, total symptoms, or general symptoms are risk factors for the developing of psychosis in one of these states. However, the global functioning, a good global functioning before the onset and to be employment are protective factors. Some of these factors we can't modify, like male gender, for example, but another we can modify. So it's important for us. So in this study, the authors analyzed 42 meta-analyses meta published in the last six years, and they saw that the clinical high risk for psychosis individuals were young, more frequently men, and presented with attenuated psychotic symptoms lasting for more than one year before the presentation and especially side services. They had a lot of uh, comorbidity, like substance use, comorbid mental disorders, like suicidal ideation and self-harm, and showed impairments in work, educational functioning, social functioning, and quality of life. The prognosis accuracy of the instruments was good, provided they were used in clinical samples, and this is very important. These instruments are to use in clinical samples, not in general population. And the risk of psychosis was around 22% at three years of follow-up. The risk was the highest in the brief and limited intermittent psychotic symptoms subgroups, almost 40%. The baseline severity of attenuated psychotic and negative symptoms, as well as low functioning, were associated with an increased risk of psychosis. And unfortunately, no robust evidence exists to favor any indicated intervention over another for, for preventing psychosis or even ameliorating any other outcome in these individuals. This is another study looking for the transition to psychosis after more than four years of follow-up. You can see that the risk is increasing here, and after four years or more, the risk of transition to psychosis from clinical high risk for psychosis state is around 28%. What happens when we want to study under eight samples, under 18, but it happens something quite similar, as you can see here, after three years of follow-up, they presented this sample of clinical high risk for psychosis under age patients or subjects, presented 24% of risk to transition to psychosis. We have been working in Basurto for a while now about neurocognitive function, uh, functioning, especially in psychotic patients. So obviously we want to look for this kind of characteristics in the clinical high risk for psychosis subjects, looking for these domains that are more useful to us to prevent or to, yes, to prevent the transition to psychosis and the common characteristics in, in the way of uh, find the better endophenotypes to predict the transition to psychosis. So we performed the last year this meta-analysis. Uh, it was published in Hama Psychiatry to analyze the characteristics in neurocognitive domains in these individuals. We saw, as we expected, that this clinical high risk for psychosis subject presented important deterioration in all the domains we studied in all neurocognitive domain, as you can see here, uh, verbal learning, verbal memory, visual memory, and so on. The line is below zero, as you can see here. This means that compared to control, healthy control, they presented important impairments in all these domains. So we want to establish a clinical service to prevent the psychosis and to treat these clinical high risk for psychosis subjects. There are uh, these uh, services around the world, of course, especially in Europe, North America, and in Australia. This is quite obvious because they have money, so they have money to do this. These are the characteristics of these services. Uh, the professionals involved are mainly psychiatrists and psychologists, although we can find another kind of professionals involved, like nurses or social workers. 
the, the, the service is usually integrated in the National Health of Mental Service. The patients are mainly male, quite young, between 12 and 35 years old. They use to do the diagnosis the CAMS, another scale, but mainly the CAMS. And as we have said before, these subjects have, uh, have a lot of comorbidity. These are the interventions they offer, uh, especially clinical monitoring, of course, and psychoeducation, other kinds of psychological interventions as CBT. And in the cases that this is necess necessary, they can use pharmacological interventions like antipsychotic or antidepressant. Uh, the duration of preventive treatment it depends on the service, but it can vary from six months to up to five years. Um, uh, we will see why this is important, how long we should extend the care of these subjects. These are the recommendations for real-world implementation of clinical high risk for psychosis service. We should implement a standalone community in service, train a multidisciplinary team, adopt active and passive outreach, primary targeting healthcare agencies, ensure adequate risk enrichment during the recruitment, define this state through established psychometric instruments, implement a transitional and trust diagnostic service across adolescents and young adults, offer needs-based intervention and psychological interventions, use the intervention according to the characteristics and risk profile, as well as the values and preferences of the individuals, collect information and target recovery, physical health outcomes, service user satisfaction, functioning and quality of life, and extend clinical monitoring for outcomes for at least three years. These are the recommendations. So the referrals uh, for these services uh, come from the GPs, the hospitals, the outpatients clinic, of course, and some of them are self-referrals because subjects can um, ask for help as well through the websites or phone. And the difficulties to implement this kind of services uh, around the world is mainly because the lack of financial support, as you can see here, and the difficulty in recruiting clinical high-risk individuals, but this is mainly because we don't have uh, the training to do so. In this figure, you can see the risk of transition in the different um, continents. You see that in Australia, North America, and Europe, they are quite similar in this uh, is the risk of transition in the different services attending patients with clinical high risk for psychosis, around 12% is quite similar. However, in South America and in Africa, these numbers are not very representative because there are just uh, there is just one service in South America and another one in Africa, so they are not very representative of the total. This is just an example. This is OASIS, outreach and support in South London the service for clinical high risk for psychosis patients in the south of London. This is the website, it's quite easy to use. You can see here, a uh, subject can uh, look uh, information for the symptoms and do the self-referral as well if they think they need it. OASIS uh, is for patients uh, between 14 and 50 years old. They are located just here uh, at the South of London. And this area reminds me uh, of Bilbao quite a lot because they have a lot of immigrants, they uh, use a lot of cannabis, and uh, there is quite industrial, like it was Bilbao at least to the case of It's not so industrial nowadays, but it was so. They get the referrals for um, community mental health services, GPs, and first episode services for psychosis. Uh, the first episode service is in the same building as well, so sometimes they do the assessment in common with the first episode service and see which service is better for each subject, and this is a good thing, in my opinion. <laughs> 
they provide psychotherapy and psychopharmacological treatments. Almost half of the subjects are with psychotherapy and psychopharmacological interventions. This is the risk uh, of transition in the sample, in the OASIS sample. They have been working for more than 20 years now. You can see here in this study. So they saw that uh, the risk of transition to psychosis is increasing after the two years of follow-up, as you can see here, because they extend the care of these uh, subjects up to two years. But they are thinking about doing this, uh, this care longer, at least up to five years, because this risk is still increasing, maybe not, uh, not in, in all the patients, but in some of them. And what happens with the patients who don't know transition to psychosis? Well, almost 80% of them present psychopathology after six years. This means that they are under care in other specialized psychiatric services like personality disorder services, substance abuse services, or so on. So they have important pathology as well. This is our clinical high risk for psychosis uh, service, PREGAP, Prevención a Cogaste Programa, o Programa de Prevención en Gente Joven. We have been working with this since January. We accept the referrals from GPs, outpatient clinics, young and children outpatients as well by email or uh, phone. It is quite easy from the hospital as well, of course. We do the assessment of the subject. If the subject meets the criteria uh, for clinical high risk for psychosis group, we provide the treatment. If not, we can refer the subject to the appropriate service. In a second step, we want to include high school, universities, and even justice services because they see a lot of young people with uh, psychiatric problems. Our aims are, of course, to do a good diagnosis. If there are symptoms, control the symptoms, to provide family information and support, control physical health parameters as well, to do the coordination of the different needs of the user, if they need uh, psychological support, social assistance, or so on. And just to finish, I have to say that this is true that more research is needed to homogenize of clinical high risk for psychosis paradigm. The different services need, need a specific training for this kind of mental health service. We should focus on prognostic factors that matters, for example, functionality. Um, we want to develop a specific treatment intervention that can be useful in time. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, I will be more than happy to answer them now. Es que recascon.